culture is is our culture. It's our mainstream culture. There's something that kind of alludes to that type of behavior is present in high schools. Um, that, that's naive of us to assume that that the, the issue of sexual assault doesn't like it waits until you're 18. I don't want people to have to learn the hard way. I love singing and songwriting, and that was always my thing that I did. The thing that I always <clears throat> searched, went to um, when I was sad or when I was happy or when I was feeling like just about anything, um, and I wasn't doing that. So after um, I was assaulted, I realized up in, I had what I called like a nine month writer's block. I didn't write and I didn't sing and I, I felt like I couldn't. How would I define sexual violence? I would say sexual viol violence is any unwanted communication or behavior. One or more persons is forcing or coercing or threatening, manipulating someone to do something that they don't want to do without their expressed consent. It, it doesn't just have to be someone who was raped. It can be someone who um, has a stalker or someone who is in a real serious committed relationship. Sexual harassment, verbal harassment, catcalling, stalking, sexting, things that are not necessarily um, violations of people's physical bodies but are still violations. Anytime um, people use sex or anything relating to sex in a way to gain power or control over another person. Someone using their power and their privilege, whatever privileges those may be, to um, take advantage of and violate someone um, in an explicit or maybe um, implicitly sexual way. I came to understand um, and define my experience as a sexual assault survivor um, a few months after it ended because I, I, was, I felt that I was so, I was pretty blinded by the, um, the kindness of the person before it happened. Just once, once someone had been kind to me, I felt that no matter what they did, they, I, f I almost felt like they had a right to do that to me. And it took me a lot of um, reflection and time away from that person to realize that what they did was not okay. Yeah, I've had my own experiences with sexual violence in middle school, not in high school but definitely kind of gaining more knowledge about this has allowed me to go back and reframe those instances as sexual violence. I think before that, I wouldn't really know what to call it, um, but feeling the impacts of that in my high school relationships and kind of just on how I view sexuality, it's comforting and constructive to have the knowledge I know now that I originally gained to help other people to then go back and kind of do some self-care surrounding that. When I was 13, I was sexually assaulted and I kept that experience to myself until I was a junior in high school and I was traveling abroad in Spain actually and I was uh, abroad on the road with a bunch of girls my age and um, it kind of came out throughout the time abroad that some of them had been through a similar experience. When I kind of started hearing these other women's experiences and realizing that I was not alone in this kind of situation that I really felt very alone in, I felt kind of a desire to actually come out about what had happened. So I ended up calling my parents. For me personally, I felt, I mean, I was 13 years old. I barely knew anything about sex in general, you know? So going through something like that is not only confusing, uh, but 
very, a very isolated experience, I felt like. After a few months, I decided that I also wanted to share my story with the public and be able to make a difference in my own way because I felt like I was in a situation where I could really speak at a level where I would really be heard. And so I ended up going into that field where I was working with RAIN, the uh, country's largest anti-sexual violence organization, and speaking to schools and churches and rotary clubs about that experience. I had also my, my pageant title, I was Miss Teen Vermont, and then I ended up winning Miss Teen America. So I had a national level when I, at the end of that piece of my life. So I had just this really huge platform to be able to work with RAIN and speak about this topic, which was a pretty, really the highlight of my pageant career for me. It, was, it would have been empowering no matter what, but I'm very thankful that I was in that time of my life because that really gave me the courage and uh, desire to speak about it to the public and not just my family and friends. So speaking as a survivor of sexual assault, I didn't understand the value of being heard until I was really heard, until I told someone um, and told not just someone, but multiple people about it, that I felt like I was really being hurt, and that my experiences and my stories weren't something that I myself had to carry, and the weight of that wasn't really something that I had to carry, um, and that I could kind of let it go and let it out there and not hold that burden. Something I I struggle with is um, like I've told I've told a few people like in I guess more detail than I just like I was assaulted um, and what was painful for me wasn't telling them but was seeing how sad they were um, and I felt like I. struggle with and not something I really happy like I don't really adhere to that but that's my own sort of internal struggle um I remember when I told my mom um and I kind of just watched her cry about it and it's still it's something for me that like I'll cry at it again um I it's hard for me to cry about what happened? And then, you know, I think like, my nausea and my emotion and my emotion about this might not be believable because I'm upset about this. Um, but when I watched her cry about it, that was really hard. And I felt like I wanted to take away what I had to take from her. And it, it was never, it was always with sympathy and with understanding support, but something that I struggle with is, is feeling, I don't want to make anyone upset, you know? I don't want to hurt anyone else by saying that I don't want to do that. Um, I think that there needs to be more resources for people to be able to come out and tell their story, and the way that we uh, treat victims of abuse and survivors of abuse we really have to change how we focus on conversation, not so much on slut shaming, what we should do with it, what we should do with it. Well, why did she say no? Um, I feel like you should have to say no more. That stuff is irrelevant. Just because this one situation happened in their lives, that doesn't define them and it doesn't mean that it was their fault or that they were doing something wrong. I, I really wish people would um, try to sympathize more with the grasp someone abusive can have on you because I felt really, really trapped when I was in, um, in the situation that I was and no matter how many times I thought about how I deserved better and how I should get out of that situation, they just 
had so much power over me, and it was like a sword hanging over my head, and people refused to understand that. And as a result, I often, I, they make me feel like it was my own fault for letting it happen. Before, I had seen it a lot in the media. Um, I'd read a lot about abusive relationships, either physically or emotionally, sexually. And I constantly thought, like, why don't these people just get out of the relationship? But until you've experienced that, you don't understand how much of a, um, how much of a grasp that person can have on you. Rape culture goes back to the, the dawn of man. Um, and if you look at any kind of uh, literature from the Greeks to uh, Shakespeare to current day, right, it's, it's everywhere. The culture that uh, excuses, ignores, expects sexual assaults to happen. And that is based in the understanding that, again, some people have agency over their bodies and other people don't. So rape culture for me is connected not just to gender identity, for example, but also to racial constructions, ethnic constructions, uh, uh, ability, uh, and the ways that we define who is abled and who is disabled. Uh, all of those are parts of rape culture. Power and privilege, I think that's what, that's what, um, that's what sexual violence is all about. That's what the, the culture is all about. Frankly, I, I think that if there wasn't power and privilege, that um, if we didn't have those in place, I don't think we would necessarily have the same levels of sexual violence as we do. Um, I think in any type of relationship, there is a power dynamic there, and um, sexual violence and sex in and of itself is often used um, to further the power of Marginalized identities have compounded oppressions that then make them more vulnerable to, um, to more people, um, which again then perpetuates the cycle of othering and, and um, the ability to other someone certainly leads to the ability to do things that, that, you, um, that are harmful. I know, you know white feminist women my age, I'm in my mid-50s, who have worked their whole lives in an effort to end sexual violence in our in our uh, in our um, communities, who are um, really super surprised to hear that black women experience sexual violence at a much higher rate, and it's not that it's not even that and so they, it's not that they don't care about that it's that it never occurred to them. Understanding as a society of what other people's experiences are, and we don't value other people in society, especially minorities, especially people that don't um, have the same privilege as other people, that somehow that their voice is not as heard as someone else's or not as valuable as someone else's and that the weight of their words. For me personally, um, because the perpetrator was male, to even be able to talk to another male, and this is incredible, incredibly specific to just how I was feeling, and I don't think this is um, the same for everyone. But to be able to talk to another man and say, this is my experience, and then to get that validation of that is wrong was really powerful. And I feel like any time that people feel marginalized, to hear from the group that historically marginalized them, that they are validated in those feelings and validated in feeling wronged is really empowering. From my personal experience, yes, it is a problem. It may not be severe as rape in every case, even though that does happen, but it'd be unfair to say that it's not and to not try and do something to stop it. It's not really talked about a lot. Like, I talk to my friends about it and they're like, oh, like, no, it's not a problem. Like, why don't girls report it? But First of all, it's not easy for girls to report it because there's so many implications on their own lives that people don't understand. But I think a lot of it has to do with athletics and kind of the perception that like, athletes like run stuff, which is not true at all. And that because you have got some sort of athletic capability, you're entitled to a lot more than you should be, which also is not true at all. I think social media is a really big component and that we are by nature competitive creatures and we feel scared when we think we're getting left behind in the same way that if we're the last person 
in a pack running away from a lion, we don't want to get eaten. We don't want to be the only person not hooking up with someone. So therefore, there's this pressure that, okay, if I feel like because of this person's post on social media, they were at a party, they were having sex, I feel like I'm behind if I'm not at a party and having sex. And I feel like that kind of contributes to that culture. It's like rape culture and toxic masculinity, like no one likes those terms, especially like for boys from what I hear, like whenever someone says like toxic masculinity, everyone's like, no, like, that ain't me. But yeah, they definitely exist. Like you see kids talking about like, you know, like there's, like I can hook up with this many girls, like yo, I could, I, I'd tap that. Or, like just the simplest things like that go a long way with how people think. I think for a lot of boys, like talking about girls, in more of like a powerful standpoint where they kind of are the ones who are trying to hold the power. Um, like by saying like, oh, like I tap that, you're kind of implying that you have authority like over women. I think that plays out in a negative way because you say it, your friend say it, says it, that's how people start to think. That's how like the community starts to think. And, I feel like as high school students, um, especially as American high school students, sexual violence isn't really a talked about issue among families or within our school system. And so what I think is when people start talking about it, they're letting other people give their input, people of different genders, people of different sexualities, and that new input makes them think about it and makes them think and personalize how they're reacting and how they're acting. We have a taboo about sex in general and so it makes it even harder to have healthy relationships and to know how to tell someone when we're attracted to them or tell someone when we're not attracted to them. So I feel like there's a prevalence of sexual violence in this gray area that we wouldn't even consider sexual violence, especially within relationships. I feel like we need to spend a lot more time talking about what happens when someone we trust want something from us that maybe we don't want to give or or something happened that we didn't want to happen and so how to have conversations how to um really talk about different issues that might come up and to be frank about it and i think there's a lot of pressure to be sexually active i think there's a lot of pressure to um be nice and um, not rock the boat. And, and I think that it's important that we do rock the boat, that we do have conversations. And if someone doesn't want to have intimacy, that they feel really confident in saying no and that the other person would respect that. But it definitely has baseline resonance of no one should be touched or feel violated at any time. And even that can be different that can mean very different things for different people but i think making your own type of boundaries and knowing yourself well enough is really impactful if you're not willing to talk about things um then whatever those things are are bound to kind of go awry um, because you can't set boundaries and say that this is wrong or this is okay. So I think that limiting the conversation to college students and people that are quote unquote mature enough to hear it is ridiculous. If the majority of sexual education is coming from pornography in our country, especially at the age of nine for boys, I feel like the younger we can start these dialogues and kind of break down the myths of sexual violence and relationships in general, the better. So, you know, Audre Lorde said, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. So we've built a house of master's tools. And um, so the exploration, the thing that I think is exciting about the movement today, being led by mostly young, young people, is this idea that um, we have to change our institutions if we expect a, to be able to change the culture. CVU Student Act is a club that Walter Braun and I started at the beginning of the year and shortly afterwards Iris helped us start it. A group of individuals who are dedicated to the awareness curriculum and training being implemented surrounding sexual violence at our high school. 
Um, it started as a way to bring students together to talk about sexual violence at CBU and in our country and a way to raise awareness for it and uh, help our school deal with the issue and uh, spread the message of anti-sexual violence. We're working on a lot of different things at the moment. Um, a big part of that is just education, so that feeds into the awareness as well as the curriculum side of things, so getting some more ninth grade curriculum that's de dedicated to sexual violence and consent, um, hopefully being implemented by the student members of ACT. I think that, I think if we're not talking about something, we're not confronting it, and therefore we're not changing it. It's important to kind of facilitate these conversations and have them so that we can end rape culture within our high schools. Again, if something's never addressed, it can never be changed. Rape culture comes from a society, which is a group of people. And so I think everybody has something they can do. You don't need a camera. You don't need anything. You just need to be there. You just need to be there so someone can talk and listen. See them as a human being and share compassion and sympathy with them. So if they come to you, you have to believe them. You have to engage with them. You have to show that you're listening to their conversation. And be willing to take on what they're saying. Because I, it, I think when we're having conversations, you can tell people um, that you're talking to are really there and are really listening to you. And that's what matters the most. And, and I really fiercely believe that um, the time is, it's well past time um, for us to, to grow up about this as adults and get real. And the visual I like to think of is someone holding a mic, the ally holding the mic, but then like, using their arm and extending it out to the other person. Everyone has their own journey of getting through their situation and it's important that if you're a friend or a family member or someone you're not just saying, okay, well you need to press charges or you need to do this. It's, you can't tell someone what they need to do. I think that everyone has their own way of going about it. You're just along for the ride and helping them as best you can. We have to recalibrate our values around the idea that nobody gets thrown away. Everybody's got a full humanity to them and that we can and we believe in change. I, there was one day I remember like damn it I'm not gonna stay in bed all day today. I'm going to get out of bed, I'm gonna take a shower, I'm gonna drink a glass of water, I'm gonna take vitamins and I think that day I went for a drive and I listened to some of my one of my favorite artists and just sang and drove to, I think it was Shelburne Pond, and just like looked at the water for a little while. Um, so the saying, time heals all, all wounds, is garbage. <laughs> I think that time um, is needed, and time is valuable, but it's what you do with that time, and it's what it's how you treat that time and it's what you do within that time that really makes a difference. And even today I don't think that I'm, I don't think you ever fully get over it. I don't think it ever is something that totally leaves you, which is scary and is horrifying. I'm here now and I'm good and I'm like, I'm like genuinely good. You call me. Tremble down.